A very good evening aspirants, I welcome you all to the Hindu daily news analysis brought to you by Shankar IS Academy. Now before getting into discussion, I have an important announcement for you. The announcement is regarding prelims test series. Shankar IS Academy is going to start pre-storming batch 1 for UPSC prelims 2024. The first test will be conducted on 18 September 2023. A total of 48 tests including CSAT and mock tests will be provided in the test series. So kindly register to the test series immediately and boost your film score. Now with this announcement let us get into the daily news analysis. Today I am going to cover important news articles from the Hindu newspaper dated 10th and 11th of September 2023. Displayed here is a list of news articles that we will be discussing today you can go through it. At the end of the video we will also have prelims practice question discussions. So try to watch the entire video and a kind request to you all those who haven't yet subscribe to our YouTube channel do subscribe and hit the bell icon button so that you will get regular notifications about our current affairs videos. Now let us get into our first news article discussion. Look at this article from Sunday's newspaper. Now before getting into the discussion, I want to share with you a thing. See UPSC never asks random questions. Even the question from the static part is linked to current affairs. For example, look at this previous year question from 2021 UPSC prelims. This is the question from economics static part. But the thing is that due to COVID-19 induced lockdown, the world was at a brink of recession. So in 2021 UPSC prelims, they asked a question about the steps to address recession. Okay. So like this, most of the static parts are linked to current affairs. So this makes current affairs more important for the UPSC exam. Now look at this image here. As you can see, the Konark wheel from Odisha Sun Temple served as the backdrop for Prime Minister Modi's welcome handshake with G20 leaders when they arrived at the G20 summit venue. So in all probability we can expect a question about the Konark wheel or the Konark Sun Temple in next year's UPSC exam. So in our discussion today we will see some points about the Konark Sun Temple and the Konark wheel. Now let us start with Konark Sun Temple. The Konark Sun Temple is located in the town of Konark which is in the state of Odisha. The word Konark is a combination of two words namely Kona and Arka. Here Kona means corner and Arka means sun. So when these two words combine, Konark becomes son of the corner. The Konark Sun Temple is located in the northeastern corner of Puri and it is dedicated to the sun god Surya. Okay. Note that Konark is also known as Arka Ketra. The temple was built in the 13th century AD during the reign of Narashima Deva I. Narashima Deva I belonged to the Eastern Ganga dynasty. He was a devotee of Sun God, so the temple was designed as a chariot to Sun God. Now coming to the plan of the temple, as you can see in this image, the plan of the Sun Temple consists of three sections in a row. The sections being the main shrine, prayer hall and a dance pavilion. The main shrine is connected to an entrance and prayer hall. And the dance pavilion is a separate structure. As like many temples of northern India, the entire Konark Sun Temple is raised off the ground on a plinth to emphasize its holiness. And note that the Konark Sun Temple is a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Okay, these are all some of the points about Konark Sun Temple. Now let us see a few points about Konark Wheel. See the major attraction in the Sun Temple of Konark is the Konark Wheel. As I already mentioned, the entire temple is designed as a huge chariot. The temple has 12 pairs of wheels, that is 24 wheels, and they are being pulled by 7 horses. The 12 pairs of wheels are similar in size and shape. Okay. See, each wheel has 8 larger spokes and 8 thinner spokes. And there are various interpretations about the wheels. Some believe that 7 horse represents 7 days of the week. Then 12 pairs of wheels represents 12 months of the year and the 24 wheels represents 24 hours of the days. And there are others who believe that the 12 pairs of wheels represent 12 zodiac signs. Now coming to the wheel, as you can see in this image, the thicker spokes are all curved with circular medallions at their centers on the widest part of the face. The medallions in the spokes are carved with the figures of women in various luxury poses mostly of sensual nature. So this is one of the important features of Konark wheel. And the another important feature is that two of the 24 wheels can be used as a sundial. 
here a sundial is a time keeping device that uses the position of sun's shadow to indicate the time of the day as you can see in this image the corner wheel has eight wider spokes and eight thinner spokes the distance between two wider spokes is 3 hours that is 180 minutes then the distance between a wider spoke and a thin spoke represents 1.5 hours and there are 30 beats between one wider spoke to the next thinner spoke and each beat represents 3 minutes see this sundial shows time in an anti clockwise direction and the top center wider spoke represents 12 o'clock midnight when you place your finger at the center of the axle the place when the shadow of the finger falls represents the time of the day okay this is how the corner wheel can be used to assess time also know that the newly introduced 10 rupees note has the corner wheel in its back side okay these are all some of the important points about corner wheel and that's all regarding this discussion this discussion is all about the corner and temple and corner wheel see this topic is very very important for your prelims exam so revise all the facts that we discussed now with these points in mind let us move on to the next news article discussion look at this news article last friday a 6.8 magnitude earthquake had struck the marrakesh which is a city in morocco and yesterday a 4.8 magnitude aftershock earthquake has also registered in marrakesh see nearly 2100 people have lost their lives due to earthquake apart from this the earthquake also flattened some villages around the marrakesh city and currently the rescuing operations is going on in marrakesh city this is all about the news now in this discussion let us learn some points about earthquake see in simple words an earthquake is shaking of the earth the earthquake is a natural event which is caused due to release of energy now where the energy is released from and why does their shakes see the release of energy occurs along a fault here a fault is nothing but a sharp break in the crustal rocks when there occurs a break in the crustal rocks the rocks along a fault tend to move in opposite directions however the tendency of rocks to move apart overcomes the friction at some point of time as a result of friction the rock blocks get deformed this eventually causes the rocks to slide past one another abruptly and this slide past event causes a release of energy okay the released energy waves travel in all directions which causes the earth to shake so the abrupt slide past event is what causing the earth to shake okay hope you understand how earthquake occurs now coming to the event of earthquake see the point where the energy is released is called focus of an earthquake and it is also called as hypocenter the released energy waves traveling in different directions and they finally reach the surface the point on the surface that is nearest to the focus is called epicenter see epicenter is the first place to experience energy waves and it is a point which is directly above the focus okay this is all about earthquake now talking about the types of earthquake waves see the earthquake waves are basically of two types they are body waves and surface waves now let us see them one by one now first let us take body waves see the body waves are generated due to the release of energy at the focus and they tend to move in all directions know that the body waves travel throughout the body of the earth the body waves interact with surface rocks and it generates a new set of waves called surface waves okay note that there are two types of body waves they are called p and s waves now let us see them one by one now first let us take p waves see the p waves move faster and they are the first to arrive at the surface these waves are also called as primary waves note that the p waves are similar to sound waves so they travel through gaseous liquid and solid medium okay now coming to s waves see the s waves arrive at the surface with some time lag these waves are also called as secondary waves an important fact about s waves is that they can travel only through solid materials okay note that the s wave only helped the scientists to understand the structure of the interior of earth okay this is all about the body waves now coming to the another type of earthquake waves that is the surface waves see surface waves move along the surface of the earth here the velocity of surface waves changes as they travel through different materials with different densities the denser the material the higher is the velocity okay note that the surface waves are more destructive 
they cause displacement of rocks and the collapse of structures like buildings and houses okay now finally let us see how earthquake is measured see the earthquake events are measured using two scales they are magnitude scale and intensity scale now first let us see about magnitude scale see the magnitude scale is also known as richter scale here the magnitude is related to the energy released during earthquake in the richter scale the magnitude is expressed in absolute numbers that is from 0 to 10 now coming to intensity scale this scale is also known as mercalli scale here the intensity scale takes into account the visible damages caused by the earthquake know that the range of intensity scale is from 1 to 12 okay and that's all regarding this discussion this discussion is all about the causes of earthquake then about the types of earthquake waves and finally we saw some points about the measurement of earthquake see this topic is very much important for your prelims so make note of each and every points that we discussed now with these points in mind let us move on to the next news article discussion look at this news article from sunday's newspaper last saturday india launched the global biofuels alliance on the backdrop of g20 summit our prime minister urged the g20 nations to join the initiative the news article also states that our prime minister proposed launching the g20 satellite this satellite will focus on environment and climate observation and this is all about the news article given here now in this discussion let us see few points about global biofuels alliance the global biofuel alliance is an initiative by india as the g20 chair the initiating members of the alliance include argentina bangladesh brazil india italy mauritius south africa the united arab emirates and the united states note that the alliance contains the members from both g20 and non g20 countries also note that canada and singapore are admitted as observer countries of the global biofuel alliance okay now coming to the objective of the alliance the main objective of this alliance is to increase adoption of biofuels globally to increase the adoption of biofuels our prime minister made a plea to ensure 20 percentage blending of ethanol with petrol globally as the alliance is in the nascent stage we will wait for a while until further information arrives this is all about global biofuel alliance now as part of this discussion we will see some points about biofuels and ethanol blending now let us start with biofuels see currently the world mostly runs on fossil fuels namely crude oil natural gas and coal these fossil fuels are produced from organic matter through a very slow natural processes for example let us take crude oil see crude oil is formed when organic matter is subjected to a large amount of pressure and temperature due to significant accumulation of sediment above the organic matter see 70 percentage of oil deposits existing today were formed from organic deposits that accumulated in the mesozoic age that is 252 to 66 million years ago so fossil fuels are produced from organic matter through very slow natural processes see the fossil fuel releases more carbon into the atmosphere which in turn causes air pollution now coming to the biofuel unlike fossil fuels biofuels are produced over a short span of time from organic matter and it is very less polluting than fossil fuels see both fossil fuels and biofuels are obtained from organic matter but the difference lies in the production process and associated pollution okay some of the examples of biofuels include bioethanol biodiesel and biogas okay this is all about biofuel now coming to ethanol blending see in india we have the ethanol blended petrol program which is in line with national policy on biofuels 2018 under ethanol blended petrol program the indian government has two blending targets the first one is 10 percentage of blending of ethanol with petrol by the year 2022 and the second target is 20 percentage blending by 2025 okay these are all the objectives that the indian government aims to achieve under ethanol blended petrol program now what are the advantages of ethanol blending the first advantage is reducing greenhouse gas emission as ethanol is a cleaner fuel blending ethanol with petrol will help reduce carbon emission so this will aid in india's aim of becoming carbon neutral by 2070 then the second advantage is energy security by promoting the use of domestically produced ethanol india can reduce its dependence on imported crude oil 
This helps India to conserve its forex reserve. In addition to this, reducing dependence on imported crude oil reduces country's exposure to volatile global oil prices. This will help in establishing macroeconomic stability. Then the third advantage is boost to the agricultural sector. See bioethanol is produced mainly from crops like sugar can and corn. So ethanol blending supports the agricultural sector by creating a market for crops like sugar can and corn. This in turn generates income for farmers and contributes to rural development. And finally ethanol blending increases engine performance of the vehicles. See ethanol can enhance the octane rating of petrol. Here octane rating means higher performance mainly in vehicles with E20 compliant engines. So ethanol blending increases engine performance. So these are all some of the advantages of ethanol blending. And that's all regarding this discussion. In this discussion we saw some points about global biofuel alliance and then we saw some points about biofuel and ethanol blending. Now with these points in mind let us move on to the next news article discussion. Look at this FAQ page article from yesterday's newspaper. See recently a report titled Pathways to Circular Economy in Indian Electronic Sector was released by Indian Cellular and Electronics Association. This report provides some data about circular economy in India. So in this backdrop only this article here is written. This article speaks about the importance of circular economy in Indian electronic sector and the challenges associated with circular economy in India. So in our discussion today we will understand all these points in detail. Now first let us understand the term circular economy. Circular economy refers to the sustainable economic model that focuses on reusing and recycling of existing materials rather than using new materials. For example, let us take a company that manufactures plastic bottles for soft drinks. See people usually buy these drinks and they throw away the bottles after consuming the drinks. This is what happens in linear economy. But in a circular economy, the plastic bottles are not discarded as a waste. The used bottles are collected, recycled and turned into new products. So this will reduce the need for new plastic production and minimizes environmental impact. So the circular economy saves resources, reduces waste and promotes sustainability. Ultimately circular economy reduces damage to environment and it creates additional revenue in the economy. For example China had used 5% of recycled materials to make new products in 2019. And the China is also planning to increase this to 35% by 2030. Okay. I hope you understood about circular economy. Now coming to the e-waste management in India, see recently there was a huge increase in e-waste generation in India. This is due to the availability of cheaper smartphones and increased usage of smartphones because of affordable data plans. See in India most of the electronic waste management is not done through formal channels. Instead it is handled informally which is a major issue. The report by Indian Cellular and Electronics Association says that around 90% of e-waste collection and 70% of recycling are managed by informal sector in India. So the report highlights the need for expanding formal sector in e-waste collection and recycling. Also note that there were many specialized hubs developed in India for e-waste management. Some places like Moradabad have become hubs for e-waste processing. Here large quantities of printed circuit boards from electronic devices are processed to extract valuable materials like gold and silver. So in order to regulate the e-waste management and bring it into formal sector, government introduced e-waste management rules in 2022. This rule aims to make e-waste management process a more digital and transparent. Okay, This is all about the status of e-waste management in India. Now with this information we shall see the various steps to improve e-waste recycling in India. The first important step is public-private partnerships. See the author of the article suggests that both the government and private companies need to work together for e-waste management. They should share the costs for creating a reverse supply chain. Here the reverse supply chain involves collecting used devices, wiping them of personal data and sending them for recycling. Okay. Then the second important step to improve e-waste recycling process in India is creation of record keeping system. It means creating a digital database to track all the materials collected by the recyclers. This will enhance the efficiency of waste management. 
Then the third important step is creating high yield recycling centers for waste collection. See these are the areas where the collected devices are brought together and recycled. These recycling centers should become more efficient in extracting valuable materials like rare metals from semiconductors. Then the fourth important step is promoting repair of old electronic items. The author of the article advises promoting repairs and make products last longer. This can be done by supporting the concept of right to repair. This will help to reduce the environmental impact of electronic waste. So these are some of the important steps mentioned in the article for improving e-waste collection in India. Now we got to see about the challenges in e-waste management. The first important challenge is prevalence of informal sector in India. As we saw earlier there is large informal sector engaged in e-waste recycling and it is very hard to regulate them. This is because they do not follow the environmental rules and it is a major concern. So prevalence of informal sector in e-waste recycling is the first important challenge. The second challenge is accumulation of huge unused devices. Around 200 million electronic devices are estimated to be present unused in people's homes. This is because people are worried about their personal data if they recycle these devices. So data concern is also another challenge associated in e-waste management. Then the third challenge is regarding recycling plans. See creating a large scale recycling plans is costly and there is a shortage of materials to run these plans for consistent operations. Apart from this, the availability of materials needed for recycling is scattered and it is not easy to find. Even big companies interested in recycling are struggling to get enough materials for recycle process. So the shortage of materials is also another problem associated with managing e-waste in India. See the author concludes by saying that a circular economy for e-waste is attractive because it can provide a stable supply of electronic components. However, the recycling of e-waste is expensive and it poses a big challenge to recycling of e-waste in India. See there are various startups and companies in India that have now started to collect and recycle electronic waste. What we need is we need better implementation methodologies and inclusion policies to meet our recycling targets in an environmentally sustainable manner. And that's all regarding this discussion. In this discussion we saw about what is circular economy, then about the importance of circular economy, then we saw about the status of circular economy in India and the challenges associated with circular economy. Now with these points in mind let us move on to the next news article discussion. Look at this FAQ page article from Sunday's newspaper. As you all know recently the 2023 G20 summit was held at New Delhi on September 9th and 10th. The summit was concluded with various outcomes. So in our discussion today we will understand some basics about G20 and then we will understand the outcomes of recent G20 summit. Now before getting into discussion the syllabus regarding this discussion is highlighted here you can go through it. Now first let us go through the basics of G20. See the G20 or group of 20 is an intergovernmental forum comprising 19 countries and European Union. It is composed of most of world's largest economies including both industrialized and developing nations. The G20 accounts for around 90% of gross world product, 75-80% to of international trade, two-thirds of global population and roughly half of the world's land area. The G20 was founded in 1999 in response to several world economic crises. Initially it worked as a forum for the central bank governors and finance ministers to discuss global economic and financial stability. And after the 2008 global financial crisis it was upgraded to the level of heads of state or government. Since then the G20 leaders have met on a regular basis with summits involving each member side of government or state. So this is how the G20 has emerged as a leading platform for global economic cooperation. See the members of G20 countries are displayed here, you can go through it. Here you can see that India is also a member of G20 grouping. In fact India is a founding member of G20. Okay. Now talking about the G20 presidency, see the presidency of G20 rotates every year amongst its members. And a unique thing about the G20 president is that the country that holds the presidency works together with its predecessor and successor. This grouping inside G20 grouping is called Trioka. The G20 has such an arrangement to ensure the continuity of the agenda. Currently Brazil, Indonesia and India are the Trioka countries. 
சி ஆன் நவம்பர் சிக்ஸ்டீன் டூ தௌசண்ட் டுவெண்ட்டி டூ த இந்தோனேஷியன் பிரசிடென்ட் ஜோகோ விடோடோ அஃபிஷியலி ஹேண்டட் ஓவர் த ஜி டுவெண்ட்டி பிரசிடென்ட் டு இந்தியா அட் த எண்ட் ஆஃப் டூ தௌசண்ட் டுவெண்ட்டி டூ ஜி டுவெண்ட்டி சம்மிட் அண்ட் இந்தியா அஃபிஷியலி அசியூம்ட் த ஜி டுவெண்டி பிரசிடென்சி ஆன் ஃபர்ஸ்ட் டிசம்பர் டூ தௌசண்ட் டுவெண்ட்டி டூ நான் கம்மி டு இந்தியாஸ் பிரசிடென்சி சி த ஜி டுவெண்ட்டி ஸ்லோகன் ஆஃப் இந்தியாஸ் பிரசிடென்சி இஸ் வாசுதெய்வ குடும்பகம் விச் இஸ் ட்ரான்ஸ்லேட்டட் ஆஸ் ஒன் பிளானட் ஒன் ஃபேமிலி ஒன் ஃபியூச்சர் ஓகே தீஸ் ஆர் சம் ஆஃப் த பேசிக்ஸ் அபவுட் ஜி டுவெண்ட்டி Now moving on to see about the outcomes of recently held G20 summit. The first important outcome is the African Union joined the G20 organization and it became a full-time member. See the African Union is a continental body comprising of 55 African member states. See African Union has long been a guest invitee to the G20 meeting along with other significant international organizations like World Bank, Monetary Fund and so on. So African Union was formerly known as an invited international organization at the G20 currently with full membership of G20 african union will have the same status as the european union see adding african union to the grouping has huge implications this is because african continent has 60% of world's renewable energy assets and more than 30% of key minerals to renewable and low carbon technologies see congo alone has almost half of the world's cobalt which is essential for lithium ion batteries productions so adding african union to the g20 grouping has both economical and geopolitical significance okay this is the first outcome then the second outcome is that india middle east europe usa corridor has been proposed and passed by the leaders of these countries see the india middle east europe economic corridor is a mega project to unlock the economic potential of the region it comprises of an eastern corridor connecting india to the gulf region and in northern corridor connecting the gulf region to the europe okay this corridor will include a railway and ship rail transit network and road transport routes in simple words the agreement will connect india through ports shipping routes and rail corridors to countries in the middle east and then eastern and western europe okay this project is a very significant one because it is also seen as a countering measure to china's belt and road initiative okay This is the second outcome. Thirdly, the G20 countries agreed on incremental progress on climate change. For example, the G20 leaders agreed to triple renewable energy capacity globally by 2030 and they have accepted to phase down uninterrupted coal power supply. Despite the grouping accepted to triple its renewable energy capacity globally by 2030, no new major climate goals were insisted. and the grouping also did not provide any plan to amend existing policies and targets see nearly 4 trillion us dollars a year would be needed to pay for a green energy transition but the grouping did not lay out any pathway to mobilize the required fund okay this is the third outcome and finally concerning russia ukraine war g20 nations agreed that states cannot grab territory by force the g20 grouping has also highlighted the suffering of the people of ukraine but it avoided dark criticism of russia for the war see last year the g20 condemned russia for the war and demanded that russia should withdraw from ukraine but this year no such remark has been made this is interpreted as a softening of g20 position from previous year okay and that's all regarding this discussion in this discussion is about the basics of g20 grouping and then we saw about the outcomes of recently concluded g20 meeting Now with these points in mind let us move on to the next news article discussion look at this news article as we all know on 9th september the african union was made a part of g20 so this news article here mentions that african leaders welcomed the anonymous decision by the g20 countries to admit african union and this is all about the news article now in this discussion let us see a few points about african union now let us start with the basics see the african union is a continental body consisting of 55 member states here continental body means all members belong to the continent of africa see the image here highlights the member states of african union here the suspended members of african union include guinea mali burkina faso niger gabon and sudan and note that the headquarters of african union is at addis ababa ethiopia okay now coming to the formation of african union the african union was officially launched in 2002 succeeding the organization of african unity see the organization of african unity originally focused on decolonization and ending apartheid 
in July 2002, the African Union was launched from Durban, South Africa. Upon launch, the AU shifted its focus towards cooperation and integration among African states. See, through cooperation and integration, the African Union aims to achieve economic development among its member states. Okay, now having covered the basics, now let us see some points about organizational structure of African Union. See, the African Union has key decision-making organs including the Assembly of Heads of State and Government, the Executive Council, the Permanent Representatives Committee, Specialized Technical Committees, the Peace and Security Council and the African Union Commission. See, the African Union encourages participation of African citizens and civil society through the Pan-African Parliament and the Economic, Social and Cultural Council. Furthermore, the African Union is working to establish continental financial institutions like African Central Bank, African Investment Bank and African Monetary Fund. Apart from this, regional economic communities and the African peer reviewing mechanism are also important components of African Union's structure. Okay. Now having seen the organizational structure, let us see the objectives of African Union. See there are many objectives that the African Union is working on, we will see them one by one. The first objective is promoting Pan-Africanism. See, the African Union encourages a sense of African identity and solidarity among its member states and citizens. Secondly, African Union promotes peace and stability through Peace and Security Council. Thirdly, to enhance unity and cooperation, the African Union aims to economically and politically integrate the African nations. Fourthly, the African Union aims to address the socio-economic challenges of African nations through sustainable development. Fifthly, the African Union promotes democratic governance and the protection of human rights. Apart from this, the African Union also aims to ensure democratic governance through transparent elections and protecting human rights through the rule of law. And finally, the African Union represents African countries in international forums. By representing the African nations, the African Union tries to promote African interests on the global stage. Okay. So these are some of the objectives of African Union and that's all regarding this discussion and this discussion is all about the formation of African Union, then about the organizational structure of African Union and finally we saw some points about the objectives of the African Union. Now with these points in mind let us move on to the next news article discussion. Look at this news article, yesterday the US President Mr. Joe Biden has made an official visit to the Vietnam and he gave a press conference there. Some journalists have raised a question about the Quad's indirect objective of countering China. While responding to the question, Mr. Biden stated that Quad was not formed to counter or isolate China. Rather, it was formed to maintain stability in the Indo-Pacific region. Okay, this is all about the news. Now in this discussion, we will see some points about Quad grouping from Prudlum's perspective. The Quad is an informal strategic dialogue forum. It comprises of four countries, namely US, India, Australia and Japan. Now coming to the formation of Quad, see the Quad was started as an informal partnership of countries aftermath of 2004 tsunami crisis. At that time, the main aim was to provide humanitarian assistance in the countries during disasters. However, the grouping got institutionalized in 2007 in the Asian meeting due to the efforts of late Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe. But the problem was that the group was inactive for a decade that is from 2007 to 2017. Subsequently in 2017 in the wake of rising Chinese ambitions in the Indo-Pacific region, the Quad was renewed. And in 2021, the leaders of Quad had their first formal summit. So this is how the Quad came into existence. Now we shall see the core objectives of Quad one by one. Firstly, the Quad aims to bring out rules based global order. Secondly, the grouping aims to ensure freedom of navigation and liberal trading system in the Indo-Pacific region. And finally, the group is also working on various matters like maritime security, creating an ecosystem for investment, addressing climate change, boosting technological innovation and so on. Okay, this is all about the objectives of Quad grouping. Now finally, let us look into the significance of Quad for India. Firstly, the Quad helps India to counter the Chinese excess in the Indo-Pacific region. See, as Quad members are like-minded to counter China's aggressive behavior in the Indo-Pacific region, it helps India to contain China. Secondly, as we all know, the Quad countries have strong naval dominance. 
so in they can enhance its maritime security through cooperation with quad nations thirdly india can also tap the investments from other quad countries this in turn lead to economic development of india fourthly india can also utilize the grouping for the creation of supply chain for various materials like minerals food grains automobiles and so on and finally the quad helps india to achieve its policy of multipolarity that is engaging with multiple partners okay and that's all regarding this discussion in this discussion is all about the formation of quad then about the objectives of quad and finally we saw some points about the significance of quad for india with these points in mind let us move on to the next part of the video that is to discuss preliminary practice questions today we are having four questions i will solve three of them and one will be a quiz question for you look at the first question here five countries are given we have to find how many of the countries are suspended from african union Guinea, Morocco, Nigeria, Burkina Faso, Gabon. See the suspended members from the African Union include Guinea, Mali, Burkina Faso, Niger, Gabon and Sudan. Here Morocco and Nigeria are not suspended from African Union. So the correct answer for the question is option B only 3. Moving on, let's take up the second question. This question is regarding earthquakes. Here three options are given. You have to find which of these options is correct regarding earthquakes. Option A magnitude of earthquake is measured on Richter scale. Option B intensity of earthquake is measured on Mercalli scale. Option C sudden movement of tectonic plates leads to earthquake. Option D all of the above. As we saw in the discussion the magnitude of earthquake is measured in Richter scale and the intensity is measured on Mercalli scale. And we saw that the sudden movement of rocks or tectonic plates leads to earthquake. So here all the three options are correct so the correct answer for the question is option d all of the above moving on let's take up the final question this question was asked in 2017 upsc prelims i'll read out the question it is possible to produce algae based biofuels but what is or are the likely limitations of developing countries in promoting this industry option a production of algae based biofuels is possible in seas only and not on continents see this statement is incorrect because production of algae based biofuels is possible on both land or saline water or waste water so it is possible both in states and on continents so statement one is incorrect now coming to the second statement setting up and engineering the algae based biofuel production requires high level of expertise or technology until the construction is completed see this statement is correct setting up of algae based biofuel production requires high level of expertise or technology so second statement is correct now coming to the third statement economically viable production necessitates the setting up of a large scale facilities which may raise ecological and social concerns see this statement is correct because economically viable production necessitates the setting up of large scale facilities which may raise ecological and social concerns as it will reduce the amount of food available for humans so third statement is correct here the correct answer for the question is option b 2 1 3 only This is a quiz question for you today. I will post this quiz question in the community section. Try to answer it. And displayed here are main questions for your practice. Go through the questions, write your answers, and post it in the comment section. With this, we have come to the end of the video. If you found our video to be useful, do like, comment, and share it with your friends. And don't forget to subscribe Shankar Ice Academy YouTube channel. Thank you for listening.